and that's what attracts more than 70 people a day to move into our community. But the economic forces are creating a strain on those who can't afford to live here. We know this forum alone will not solve the problem, but the purpose tonight is threefold. First, we want to present the findings from the series so far. We have a panel of experts who will talk about where we should go from here. And third, we want to ask you, the audience, to help us decide what ideas should be discussed, what solutions are possible, and what expectations you have. We also want to press leaders to make decisions that will benefit our entire community. This event, as David told you earlier, is being streamed on Tennessean.com. We'd like for you to tweet. We want to make sure you post on Instagram and Facebook, but we need to silence our phones as well. So um, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to David Plazas. I know he needs no introduction because you all know who he is. And he was the author of the series, and he will continue to write the series the rest of this year. So. With that, I'll turn it over to you. Good evening again, and thank you so much. One regret I have tonight is that my partner in this project, George Walker, couldn't be here tonight. Uh, he is covering the Preds up in St. Louis, and so, uh, so go Preds. Hopefully they win tonight. Uh, but he's been fundamental in this series because he's a Nashville native. I'm not. I've been here for two and a half years. So we see this issue from very different lenses, from very different experiences. And yet I think that has helped us really work very, very well together. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to do before I started is just give some thanks to some dignitaries who are here in the room, including Davidson County Assessor Vivian Wilhoit, who is here. Thank you so much. And I also saw Councilman John Cooper uh, over there. And I'm hoping if I haven't missed any elected officials who might be here. But thank you very much for coming and for your interest. And for those of you who are watching the live stream, welcome. Please feel free to tweet your questions or observations, and I'll certainly get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, so what we're showing you on, uh, in the slideshow earlier today was pictures that George took of the different people that we've been profiling and also the sites that we've seen. Nashville has changed tremendously. Imagine being in a neighborhood like Edge Hill where you have one bungalow home right next to a tall and skinny. That's a reality today. It's a reality we're seeing not just there in Edge Hill but also across the community. So what I'm going to be doing today is going part by part as quickly as I can to uh, essentially talk about what we've learned so far and then we'll get into the panel discussion about where do we go from here. So the first findings of the, of the series, which was called The Cost of Growth and Change in Nashville, part one was that Nashville's growing and changing very quickly. And meanwhile, lower income and especially historically African-American neighborhoods are being displaced. Uh, the Nashville Next uh, Comprehensive Planning Program showed us that, that Nashvillians consider affordable housing to be the number one concern, and Nashville used to be known as an affordable place to live. Since its inception in 1962, Metro Nashville Davidson County government has always favored pro-growth strategies that have seen investment in both suburban and the urban core. Uh, quote from Ansley Erickson, who's an who's a author of Making a, of an Unequal Metropolis. She's a professor at Columbia University, and she wrote about Nashville. She said, the city hasn't learned from this long history. There's still been more investment in the idea of growth than in trying to address inequality. It's clear that there's discrimination in urban Nashville. So, so far, more than 100 affordable housing units have been built, and I know that Mayor Barry today at the State of Metro talked about 900 also being in the pipeline. Uh, although affordable housing advocates have said they'd like to see between 20,000 and 40,000 units built. Mayor Barry has earmarked $10 million annually to the fund, and today announced she wanted to earmark another $10 million this year. And uh, what is affordable housing? Affordable housing, the federal definition is that it's not paying more than 30% of your income for your housing costs. But the reality is that most moderate and low-income earners are really cost burdened. They're paying a lot more than that 30%. And that's become a real, real difficult situation. And if you can imagine, during 2011 to 2015, the average home in Nashville was 167,500. Today, in March, that average was 273,500. So wages have not doubled. And that's one significant issue. And one of the things uh, that Zillow has announced, Zillow is the real estate site, is that Nashville in 2017 is the hottest real estate market in the country. Other consequences of displacement include the suburbanization of poverty, the concentration of poverty, 
And Reverend Bill Barnes, the esteemed pastor for whom the Barnes Affordable Housing Trust Fund told me in an interview, I think we're losing. We still don't want to be in a neighborhood where people are not like us. We have to remember that for a long time, cities like Nashville were segregated and a lot of the patterns of development and a lot of the patterns of, of living were based upon these rules and these laws. And now we're having to deal with a lot of those consequences. But Mayor Barry had the, uh, sat down with me a few months ago and she said that uh, affordable housing is one of the pillars of her administration. And she said there's a real downside to saying I don't want growth. People want neighborhoods to stop changing from mo the moment they get there, we are gonna change. I will have to add as well that at the State of Metro, she also made clear the message that she's looking for an economy that's beneficial to all as well. So at this time, I'd like to show you uh, this video that, that went viral actually, and it's of Sally Dowell and Janice Key, who were the faces of the first part of this series. Just going to adjust the volume and we'll get that up there. So just to tell you a little bit about Sally Dell, she is a homeowner of 45 years in the Edge Hill area. And what you'll see in this video is that she had a sign that says, this home is not for sale. And she really became the face of resistance in an area that is heavily being gentrified at this time. Uh, Janice Key is another uh, person who's being featured in this particular video. And she is someone who does want someone to make her the right offer, but it's got to be that right one because a lot of the things that we've noticed in research is that. I think it should be a lot. What we've noticed in the research is that even though people get offers for something they've never seen before, that money is oftentimes way under the value of what they could get in the open market. should be a law against it. Maybe these people sell their homes. If they're giving them away, they don't want their homes anyway. They just want the property. That's all they want. And they're not getting nothing right here. It's not going anyway. But you don't have to sell your home if you don't want to. And I don't want to, and I'm not going to. No, where am I going? I'm too old to be trying to move. I worked too hard for this house. I went home with it and barefooted and raggedy too. That's why I'm still here. I'm not going anywhere to God come get me. Buyers, investors, builders, or just single people just want to buy my home because of the area, because of the view. I would like to see them make an offer that I that would help me, then I would benefit from to relocate so I could feel comfortable in my new place. I don't want to move outside of Nashville, Antioch, Bellevue. I would love to stay. Since they start building here, I do feel like I'm being pressured out. Because once all these homes come and go up, the property tax gonna go up. And then with my small home against all these big homes, yes, I feel like I am being squared. I am being pushed out. And, and I'm, though I will not be able to afford that. So Sally's story moved so many people across the country. I received so much feedback for weeks afterwards. And actually, there was some feedback from a young lady named Molly Jean Freer of Poughkeepsie. She comes to Nashville twice a year, and she plays at the Station Inn in the Gulch. If you're familiar with the Station Inn, it's this one-story, 40-year-old building that right now is dwarfed by all these tall high-rises and hotels. And uh, Molly Jean wrote a song about it. So we'll play a portion of that song now. Uh, about uh, Sally Dell, as you remember, that she's not leaving till the good Lord gets her, and that basically is the is the purpose of the song. They keep telling me to sell, but they're gonna tear down my home. They don't wanna live there; they just need the land for their own. The big old condos, they're gonna bulldoze all.
we couldn't have a Music City program without music, and, and that was beautiful. She was just here a few weeks ago visiting, and uh, will be coming back soon, uh, probably playing at the Station Inn. But special thanks for this part to uh, Mayor Megan Berry, to Reverend Bill Barnes, Mrs. Sally Dowell, Mrs. Janice Key, and Columbia University Professor Ashley Erickson, and a special thanks to Adrian Harris, who was also in the room uh, during the interview with uh, Mayor Berry. The second part of this series uh, was called A Renter's Dilemma. And what we found, what Julian Castro, the former HUD Secretary, Housing and Urban Development Secretary, said in City Lab article in 2016 was, we have a rental affordability crisis out there in big cities and small towns, in Red America and Blue America. New census data released in March showed that the U.S. home ownership rate fell from 62.2% in 2015 to 61.9% in 2016, a 50-year low. In the Nashville, Murfreesboro, Franklin Metropolitan Statistical Area, that number fell from 67.4% to 65%. Uh, so there are fewer people who are in homes, more people who are looking to rent. And changes in ownership and renovations of apartment units across town have in some cases caused the doubling of rents and have led to the eviction of people who can't pay. And we've just seen some stories this past week. Uh, while apartment units are being built in Nashville, just look at all the cranes, they're appealing to the higher end renter. And this is not something that's unique to Nashville. This is something we're seeing across the country as well. So rents average at $872 per month between 2011 and 2015. In March 2017, $1,401. And again, we talk about that whole notion of wage inflation and wage growth, and we're just not seeing that same uh, correlation. So for the typical renter making $35,000 a year, that rent is well out of reach, and that's according to Harvard University's The State of the Nation's Housing, 2016. Uh, so 70% of low-income renters are cost-burdened. 32% of moderate-income renters are cost-burdened. Uh, Jim Frazier, Vanderbilt University professor, said to me, basically, people can't find a place. One of the problems is that all the rentals that are being built are for market rate. Bill Freeman, chairman of Freeman Webb, said to me, there's very little new affordable housing being built. One of the things that groups like Homes for All Nashville have been doing is uh, protesting these evictions and offering also classes on Tenants 101. So if you haven't heard of that or are looking for that as a solution for you to know what your rights are as a tenant, that would be very important. Meanwhile, lawmakers at the state level have been stripping tools away from the city. Here in the state of Tennessee, the state has supremacy, and so the state can nullify laws from the city. It did so last year with mandatory inclusionary zoning that would have required uh, the developers to allot a portion of their developments to affordable housing. And this year, there's a, a bill that would strip uh, voluntary inclusionary zoning as well. So other challenges are also the Section 8 waiting list, which uh, it ranges from 10,000 to 11,000 people uh, here in the Nashville area, and it's getting harder and harder to get landlords to accept those Section 8 vouchers. And in some cases, I was told by MDHA uh, Director, Executive Director Jim Harbison that sometimes he's having to give two vouchers to renters because of the cost of the, the rent. And home ownership is still seen as the best way to achieve the American dream if you can afford it. Uh, so I wanted to uh, show you a video of Kenitha Patterson. And she's our subject of the part two. Uh, and uh, she's a woman who lived in Edge Hill for most of her life, up till the time she was about 32, but then because of personal circumstances was forced to leave 35 miles west. Kenitha Patterson, I am 34 years old. I live in Cheatham County now. Originally, over 33 years, I lived in Nashville, Tennessee, Davidson County. I think my neighborhood outgrew me is the best way I could put it. Um, I experienced gentrification at its finest. Um, Many people got put out with me, rapid eviction, 14 days. But I've always thought that if you got put out that fast, you did something wrong. Or my circumstances, I missed one month's worth of rent when I was sick. It was so traumatic to find something else because people, I'm not going to say all people here don't believe in a second chance, but they really hold it against you if you have an eviction. And my husband was just coming home from uh, being incarcerated. So him being a felon and me having an eviction, is no chance that you're getting anything in Nashville. We're not bad people, so we want something good in life just like anybody else. I'm not opposed to growth at all. I'm a person that fully believes in growth. It's just 
take care of your people that are already here. And you have some people of value that are already here. Even if they look a certain way, even if they're stereotyped a certain type of way, that doesn't mean they're expendable. It's been some benefits. I never probably would have taken the jump. I was forced to take the jump, but I mean, it ended up being a good thing on my end. I can't say it's not because it, that's a blessing for my family because we ended up with a home that is it's listed as a four bedroom, but we have like three bonus rooms. So it's like a seven bedroom house compared to here. If you pay $1,400, you are going to get maybe two. So, I mean, that's the... That's the plus side of it. The commute is is a downfall, but I mean, that's the good thing about it. You get space, and they needed that space with me having that many children. I know it's convenient to be downtown, um, and it used to be a place where I lived. A special thanks to Kenitha Patterson and also to Vanderbilt University Professor Jim Frazier, Bill Freeman of Freeman Webb, Austin Sauerbrei of Edge Hill Neighborhood Partnership and Open Table, Lewis Johnson, a Five Points resident, and Bruce McNellage, a developer. So the final part that has run so far, at least in, um, in, April, in March, part of me, was how public housing will ease Nashville's housing crunch. And it's amazing because uh, in 1980, uh, one of my predecessors, Dwight Lewis, wrote a piece called Nashville's Inner City Projects uh, along with Linda Solomon. And the first par paragraph painted a very dark picture about what public housing was about. Uh, to quote his first paragraph, it was, the poor people who live there and all who live there are poor, cryptically call their neighborhoods the bricks, the trap, the hellhole, or simply the projects. The residents speak, but rarely with pride, of home. And to imagine that almost 40 years later, this could become one of the solutions to our affordable housing crunch. Uh, I want to thank Jamie Berry from the MDHA, who's just critical in helping us with this part. Uh, the Metropolitan Development and Housing Agency Executive Director, uh, Jim Harbison, uh, said to me, by the end of this year, there will not be public housing in Nashville. You can believe that the seven public housing complexes are in a process called Envision to be converted into mixed income communities. It's going to take a long time, but they've started already with Envision Casey. Some units are already built, and they're going to be breaking ground on the first mixed income uh, development later this year. So the goal of Envision Master Plans are community-oriented efforts to turn public housing developments into mixed-income developments. And uh, again, it started with Envision Casey, which like many of these developments uh, were built in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And Envision and Casey Homes is in East Nashville near Shelby Park and Five Homes. Now, it will be a long process that seeks not to displace existing residents. And that's one of the things that's really key and that really attracted me to this particular story. Because in the past, you've had public housing residents, when you have renovations or you have new construction, they get kicked out of their homes. And for a long time, we didn't know how many actually came back. We do have a statistic now. According to the Case Western Reserve University National Initiative of Mixed Income Communities, only 27% of residents came back when the Hope Six developments were made. And so, you know, it's just a staggering statistic. And so this Envision project, uh, if successful, uh, will be revolutionary. And but the question is at that point, sure, people will be able to go from one residential unit to another, but will people of market rate income, will people of, of uh, workforce income, will they move in? And that's the big question I know that keeps Mr. Harbison up at night. Uh, Nashville would be an incredibly ambitious project if it succeeded, and even more so than relatively successful mixed-income communities in Atlanta, Minneapolis, Toronto, Portland, and Akron, Ohio. But there's also another big question mark, and of course that's funding from the housing and urban development. There is a proposed 13% cut to that budget, and that's going to affect a lot of programs and projects that are going on now. It won't affect rental assistance, at least not this year. Uh, one uh, good sign we found, the editorial board of the Tennessee and met with Senator Bob Corker, who said no president's budget ever gets passed as, as proposed. So there may be some hope there as well. But now new HUD secretary, Ben Carson, is on a listening tour of the country, and I know that he may come to Nashville at some point. Uh, so the last few videos we want to show are of some of the residents, Marilyn Greer and LaCanya Hampton. They both have two different stories, but uh, both people who are eager to get ahead, to uh, move uh, beyond their circumstances, and really wonderful, uh, enthusiastic ambassadors for, for Nashville. My name is Marilyn Greer. 
I am 60 years old, and I have lived here in KC for five years. Sometimes living in the housing projects can be, it can make you be depressed. Um, with the way things are, you know, sometimes there's a lot of hopelessness that goes on in people's lives, you know. They feel like they're just stuck here and that nobody cares. And so with the Envision, Casey, I think this is a great idea. I think it's wonderful. Uh, these projects are old. They've been here since, what, 1943 or something like that. And it's time for a change. I think it's time for a change, you know. So I'm all for the Envision. I am. And I'm thinking that um, in the community, about the community, that everybody is grandfathered in, so everybody should have a stable home to come back to. I plan to be right here, because they're going to start building right there. I think it can work, you know. Uh, us as people, we can learn to live together. And it all starts with your mindset. And that goes for the middle income and the lower income. It's all in how we think, you know. Just because we're classified as poverty or low class doesn't mean that we can't live next door to you or a doctor or a nurse, you know. It's all in your mindset. So I think, I think that if people change the way that they think on both levels, on all levels, that we can all live together. It's not hard. Then we'll go next to the Laconia Hampton interview. Laconia is the mother of four children. She has uh, worked multiple jobs at one point, four jobs, uh, and uh, is, uh, and we'll play it right here and I'll tell you the rest of the story. My name is Lakaya. I'm 36, and I've been here nine years. Uh, well, uh, not only am I getting my home, um, I had a job promotion, so it's been a great year. I've had a lot of ups and downs, but I'm uh, getting my foot out the door and I'm running. <laughs> That's what I've always wanted, so. I think Habitat's a great experience for anybody. I think you better appreciate what you have when you have to put your hands in it. Like when they get ready to start building here, I think they should allow some residents to help out. Because they would probably appreciate their home if they have to help than somebody doing it for them. Well, I'm tired. I work so much. It's tired. But it's going to pay off. You know, I got to do what I got to do. So. So what Lacanya is talking about is that she was accepted after initially being rejected, accepted into the Habitat for Humanity program to go uh, build her house. And she's been giving her sweat equity, her discipline, along with uh, St. Thomas Health, which is the sponsor of her house. And if we can play the next video. Okay, everybody look at me. Now this is going to be before the uh, hands in the air, okay? So just look at me, everybody look at me real smiling. All right, now this is the one where everybody's put their hands in the air, and when I say one, two, three, you're going to cut, okay? You ready? All right, everybody start clapping. One, two, three. Yeah. 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 So in just a few weeks, Lakanya will be a homeowner. Uh, so she's gone from a very tough several years, uh, working hard, struggling, and you know, shows that she's pursuing the American dream and has done it. Uh, and it was a really emotional ceremony on Sunday. So special thanks to Jim Harvison and Jamie Berry from the MDHA, Marilyn Greer, Lakanya Hampton, Dwight Lewis, and Taryn Gress from Case Western Reserve University. At this time, I'd like to call the panel up. Uh, if you could come up here, and I will uh, start introducing you as soon as you are seated. Mm -hmm. One special note of thanks here, because he's also an avid uh, Twitterer, is Eric Cole from the mayor's office. So thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, the panel is made up of Laura Berlind, Adrian Bond-Harris, and Jeremy Haidt. 
uh, Jeremy Height, who is uh, the gentleman here is Director of Industry and Government Affairs at the Tennessee Housing Development Agency. He's responsible for strengthening THDA's relationship with industry partners, housing nonprofits, and other public entities. He previously served in key operations and communication roles in the Tennessee Department of Health and Tennessee Emergency Management Agency. He was business editor for the Nashville City Paper, and he holds a bachelor's degree in history from Berea College. Next, we have Laura Berlind, who is founding executive director of the Sycamore Institute, a nonpartisan public policy research center founded in 2015. She has 15 years of nonprofit and government finance experience. She has worked as CEO of Renewal House, public finance vice president at AMBAC Financial Group in New York, and financial analyst at Vanderbilt University. She holds a master's degree in public policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and a bachelor's degree from Boston College. And last but not least, Adrian Bond Harris, who is Senior Advisor for Affordable Housing for the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity and Empowerment, which is OEO, is that correct? OEOE. -E. Yes. <laughs> She's an urban planner and affordable housing community development professional. Past experience, the nonprofit, the Housing Fund, and Metropolitan Development and Housing Agency. She holds a Bachelor's in Public Administration from Middle Tennessee State University and a Master's in Urban and Regional Planning for the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. So thank you so much for being here. And I'd like to start with Adrian because there was some big news today by the mayor. She talked about some affordable housing initiatives. And can you take our audience through what was said and what are those things that are exciting you about that? Well, what's exciting is that the mayor uh, announced again that $10 million will be in the Barnes Fund for this year as well. Last year began the $10 million, and she's dedicated um, $10 million for each year that um, she's in office. So we have $10 million for in the Barnes Fund for affordable housing, um, and that's for nonprofit uh, housing developers that uh, can acquire land, can build affordable housing units, but also preserve affordable housing units. So that was a huge announcement. Um, before Mayor Berry, there was only $500,000 that came from the city's budget. So the fact that um, $500,000 was in Metro's budget before, and then 20 million um, as of today is exciting news for us. Additionally, um, there were three different things that she announced today. Um, $25 million in general obligation bonds for Metro to acquire and preserve affordable housing units. We've heard a lot from uh, developers who are converting existing affordable units to market rates. So this gives Metro an opportunity to buy some of those, um, hopefully some of those um, apartment complexes. Um, but also we could construct on Metro-owned land, and I think that's been something that's been innovative for, for Nashville in the last couple of months, is that we're using Metro-owned land um, to actually develop affordable and workforce housing. So 12th and Wedgwood, for instance, is 170 units in the Edge Hill area. Um, and then lastly, uh, we talked about a tax abatement program similar to Chattanooga and Memphis, where uh, developers who are providing affordable housing options will receive um, some sort of tax abatement um, so that they can either preserve affordable housing units, but even if they build it, that they um, are incentivized by tax abatement. So those were the, the big three announcements in um, housing today. Thank you. And Laura, uh, the Sycamore Institute just came out with a report related to uh, housing and health. And uh, when I had a discussion before about this particular report, it was looking at housing comprehensively. Could you describe a little bit what you found and also what you think needs to be done? Sure. So uh, we put out this report just last week, and it was called the House, uh, Housing and Health Connection. Um, and maybe I should explain with a sentence or two what the Sycamore Institute is first. Um, we are a nonpartisan public policy research center that produces data. You can't hear me. Is that better? Okay. How about now? All right. So last week we put out a report uh, called the Housing and Health Connection. Um, and then I wanted to explain that the Sycamore Institute is a, a nonpartisan public policy research center for Tennessee. So we produce data and information to inform policymakers, the media, and ultimately the public um, so that you can make better decisions. And this particular paper was really designed to help people look at affordable housing as one of the drivers of health and well-being. The idea being that if you are cost burdened, as, as David was talking about, you're spending less money on food, on health care, on transportation, on these other issues that contribute to your health and well-being uh, as a citizen of Nashville or Davidson County. And so the paper really goes down and, and details some of the, the data driving that. Um, and we really feel at the Sycamore Institute that health and well-being is an economic imperative for Nashville. So we want to encourage people to look at it that way. Thank you very much. 
And uh, Jeremy, if you could talk a little bit about the role of uh, THDA in working with municipalities and the federal government uh, and, and the kind of programs that you have. Obviously, uh, you were in the news recently with regard to a program for down payment assistance, which is uh, very exciting along with the city. Uh, THDA is the, the state housing finance agency. And, and what that means is we're, a, we're an agency that does uh, both work here in Tennessee and we pass through dollars uh, and administer some federal programs. Uh, we, we administer nine federal programs here in the state and that money comes through from the federal budget for uh, Section 8 in some areas uh, as well as other housing programs like LIHEAP and uh, the home program where we do uh, repairs to people's homes. Uh, our agency basically is, is not taxpayer funded. We are self-funded as an agency. We use our mortgage uh, bond revenue to fund all of our programs including the Tennessee Housing Trust Fund. So we do a lot of work with partners. Um, we're, we're the agency that funds efforts. Uh, we'll put tax credits uh, through a competitive process into developments and let developers then use that as leverage to reduce the capital that they need to produce a development. In return for that, they give us uh, and, and the, the community a guarantee for a period of time that those are going to include some affordable housing units. One of the questions I wanted to bring up was this whole notion of, of the middle class. This is not a problem that's unique to Nashville. In fact, we're seeing it across the country. There's a book that just came out called The New Urban Crisis by Richard Florida, talking about so many cities that are seeing this growth of prosperity and also this growth of inequality. What are some of the things you think we can do going forward for any of the panelists to really address that growing inequity? Uh, and what is most urgent on your list? Um, we are involved in, in several cohort models with other cities, uh, including one with southern cities, because I think it's important that we also consider that context. Um, and one of those cities includes Memphis. And the whole idea is we want to make sure that as we're developing affordable housing that it's mixed income um, and that that usually can include diversity. The more we have diversity um, in our neighborhoods, the more successful they will be. So we know um, it's important that as we're working with private developers and nonprofits that we're also um, making sure that it's in neighborhoods that may not have um, affordable housing, but it's also making sure that these areas that are transitioning continue um, to create affordable housing because um, the whole idea is if we are not uh, being intentional with that development, um, that we could potentially not have mixed income neighborhoods, not just developments, but neighborhoods. Um, and so we're, we're looking at other cities and, and trying to get a better understanding of what other cities are doing. But I think we're at least on to something when we're talking about mixed income. And when we talk to developers, we, we usually always, you know, ask um, if they're willing to include affordable and workforce. And we, and we provided some incentives, basically, for them to um, take that as an option. And Adrian, just as a follow-up, um, the mayor said something interesting today. She said it used a term called yimbyism. Could yes. you talk about that? Yes. Um, so everybody knows NIMBYism, not in my backyard. Um, and as we were working in the Edge Hill community on the 12th and Wedgwood project, um, Pearl Sims, who m many of you probably know, um, suggested that there should be YIMBYism, yes, in my backyard. Um, and the whole idea is that as we have more and more developers developing, we're, we're getting pushback from neighborhoods um, saying we don't want affordable housing. Um, but what they're realizing, what they're not realizing is that that includes Metro teachers, that's police officers, that's the grocery store clerk. Um, and we're trying to talk about that a little bit more about who is going to be a part of these housing developments and not just um, focus on the fact that it's affordable or workforce, but really talking about the people that actually need that housing. Um, and so that, that's really what it is, is making sure that neighborhoods understand that it's okay to have um, a mixed income approach in development. Laura? <clears throat> well, as a public policy research center, I would be remiss if I didn't say we really want to see the policy solutions being driven by data, understand what the issue is. So, for example, when you see these videos of someone who owns their home but is still cost burden, you know, you look at the data in Davidson County and 12 percent of Davidson County residents are cost burden even though they own their home uh, and have no mortgage. Um, so we really want data to drive the, the policy making and the thinking. Um, and when you think about public health departments, our public health departments across the state have some of the best source of information about the problems and the solutions they need for their communities. And so if we really use that data to inform our thinking, uh, I think we'll come up with better solutions. 
Um, I, I want to chime in on the affordable housing notion. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to do is, is, as we've gone across the state, we're trying to change people's understanding of what is affordable housing. Um, here in Davidson County, 24 of the apartment complexes that have been built, we helped finance, and you wouldn't know them as affordable. They've, that it's not the, the image you have from the 40s and 50s style uh, government housing. It, it's the, the buildings that are in the gulch. It's, it's a lot of places, and it, it's designed to be mixed from its inception. So you, you were living there and you have an affordable housing person living next to somebody who's paying market rent and you wouldn't know any different. Um, the other thing is from, from a, a housing standpoint, you know, you, we want to try and make affordable housing uh, for the first time home buyer. And that's one of the, the key cornerstones of our program is trying to get people into that first home because it does a couple things. It stabilizes a neighborhood, makes those payments. Instead of a rent payment that goes up every so often, you're, you're using a fixed 30-year mortgage, which helps get that part of, of your affordable housing in there. And you want to look at those policies. Um, we, we don't recommend policies, but we'll try to bring with our research department um, the same sort of data-driven information to local governments to make in, informed choices on what they're doing. Um, the programs to put in, uh, like Memphis has an assistance program where they, they are trying to help their teachers and their firefighters and everybody who works in the community live in that community. And it makes a huge difference when you're talking about the quality of your neighborhoods. One of the subjects in the videos, Marilyn Greer talked about the mindset issue when it comes to mixed income uh, housing. And I'm wondering if I could get from you a sense of how do we change those mindsets because we've had a uh, lot of history where you have, you know, certain houses that are segregated by income or by race, and there are perceptions of people who are not like us. What are the kind of conversations that you're having with people in the community, and how can we essentially move forward and push the envelope? Yeah, I think it's going back to who it is, the teachers. I mean, I, it's really talking about those metro employees. It's talking about um, even, like I said, the grocery store clerk, the retailer. Um, when we talk about teachers, first-year teachers make anywhere from forty to $42,000 a year. Um, that's technically in the workforce housing range. That's a little bit above 60% of the median income. Um, we want to make sure that we're recruiting and retaining the best teachers, and so the mayor has also made that a priority um, and, and we're looking at ways to make sure that we have housing for our teachers because we know that that trickles down to our children. Um, you know, I, I think one of the other things that I would just mention back on that other question, if I could, um, we're also going towards a data approach. We are working on a housing Nashville report where we will look at the um, supply demand gaps. So where have the where has there been? a significant amount of loss of affordable housing units. How do we make sure that we're increasing that loss? Um, and so in the next couple of weeks, you'll get a, uh, you'll see a report from the mayor's office that addresses that, but we'll also do an annual report of all of the initiatives that's um, happened over the last 18 months, I think it's been 18 months, um, showing all of the initiatives and all of the um, performance measures associated with it. David, you, you talked about one of our programs earlier where we uh, pushed out some federal treasury money uh, that came to the state, $60 million, and we've made it available as a forgivable $15,000 second mortgage for our, pro our home buyers who, who go through our Great Choice Mortgage Program. And here in Davidson County, that program's been in, in place since March 1st. In eight weeks, we've had uh, $350,000 in down payment assistance to help homeowners buy homes here in Tennessee, or in, in Davidson County. Um, the other thing that people get surprised by is our, our mortgage program is not a, a low income, it's not, it's not a poverty program. Uh, we can serve people who are making uh, $95,000 at a family of three here in Davidson County. That, that opens up a lot more people to home ownership who didn't maybe think they could. And then with that down payment assistance, you can get them across that threshold uh, because it's so hard to save enough money right now. Um, when, when everything's tight and you're, you're, you're in a stretch situation with your, with your rent, um, you can't build up that reserve that you need for down payment. So that down payment assistance is really key. Um, it's here in, in uh, the Antioch zip code for that 15000 but in all the zip codes in the state, we also offer down payment assistance about 5% on the purchase price. So it's a, it's a, there's a program out there. People need to look at it. Um, if they want to go to greatchoicetn.com, uh, that's our website. First buy home buyers, click that link and it'll give them some ideas of who they can work with. Um, we also require credit counselors, and that makes a huge difference in people who go through that program for counseling and understand the financial issues. When you have an informed home buyer, they don't make the same mistakes that someone who's never been a home buyer before makes. 
um, by getting into trouble with a creative financed mortgage or something like that. Final question for the panel is how do you make data actionable? Once you have it, how do you turn it into something that benefits people? So uh, based on that Housing Nashville report, once we release that, we think that could be the driver for our policy recommendations. So how can the Barnes Fund, when we say we have $10 million, how can that investment go into those areas where we've seen significant loss? Um, how can we make sure that we're increasing affordable housing opportunities in places that it has not been? Um, those are the, some of the policy questions that we then can ask once we have the data. Um, and so that's, that's what we'll be going out to the community with um, in the summer, just so that we have a, a better understanding of what the need is. Um, once we have the data, we can now talk to the folks that need it um, and ask, you know, and let the developers know. This is what we've heard from the community, this is what the data says, and this is what we need to have built. So, um, so we talk about this a lot at the Sycamore Institute, and one of um, the primary issues we think is really important is making the data accessible. And we do that in a couple of different ways. We use infographics. We go over every line of text with excruciating detail to make sure people who are non-experts can understand what we're trying to communicate. And then secondly, we don't approach these really complicated issues as black and white. We try to explain the trade-offs. Um, because every complicated issue, affordable housing, health, everything has trade-offs. Uh, so we try to be a voice for folks understanding that. I want to give a round of applause to our panel, please. And you're welcome to stay uh, there. This next part, the last 10 minutes before we go to our, our final uh, words, is just asking the audience exactly what solutions or ideas that you have. If you could raise your hand, I'll come to you so that for the live stream we can get the, the, the sound check on. But if you, if you have an idea or solution, this is the time to say, where do we drive policymakers now? Where do we take this series now? Because the goal of the Tennessean and our network is basically, in areas that make sense, put public pressure on elected officials to make the right decisions for this community. So if anyone has ideas or thoughts to share, uh, yes. proposal to members of the Metro Council and to NOAA's uh, Affordable Housing Task Force to try to stimulate investment by individual residents in Nashville and a proposal that the Barnes Fund could pool loans from individuals in Nashville so they could take some money off of Wall Street and put it directly into loans for affordable housing in Nashville. And that led me to a question for Adrian about when uh, Mayor Barry's bond fund is, uh, will those bonds be available for direct purchase by individuals in Nashville, or will that bond uh, fund be funded by big banks like Goldman Sachs and so on, or will there be a way that, like during World War II, people could buy bonds at the post office. So the idea would be that Metro would use the bonds to acquire, say for instance, I know we've heard of Prestige Point or Premier West. The idea would be that Metro would actually be able to contend and possibly buy those. So that, that's the idea with the general obligation bonds is that we could then buy those um, existing affordable housing developments and keep them affordable over time because Metro then would own it. That's, that's the idea. The question was, would those bonds be available for purchase by individual Nashville citizens? Not that I'm aware of, but we're, we're still working through a lot of this, and then we will be talking to the community over the summer as well. And I've written this down. Thank you very much. So my name is uh, Waddell Wright. I'm a local developer, and uh, mine is just a question. Are, are you, what are you guys doing in conversating with council people? We've got land holdings in two different districts, and the first thing we get encountered with is by the councilman saying they don't want affordable housing in their, their community. Well, and and I've, I guess I, I can take some of that question. I know we've, we've, we've looked at some of the projects that uh, we've awarded tax credits to here in Davidson County, and we've had some of those tax credits returned because the developers could not make that work. Um, one of the challenges that we're seeing is there's a, there's a taxing issue on how they're taxing those tax credits at the local level. 
um, where, they're, where they're taxing the value of the tax credit, not the income or the value, the revenue that's being generated by the property. Um, and that may be driving some of those issues. But, but as far as them wanting it in their district, that's a, that's a challenge. And part of why that, that tax credit part is important is if you have to go in front of Metro Council for every single development to get permission for a, what we call a payment in lieu of taxes, a pilot program, then that, that just raises the difficulty and makes that a headache every time because you're always going back in front of your local district. And it may be one group gets approved, one doesn't, even though the deals are the same and they're just located in different council districts. So you're not doing tax credit yeah. And that's one of the reasons we're trying to change that perception of what is affordable housing. Thank you, David. <laughs> I'm Councilwoman Karen Johnson, and uh, I'm in the Antioch uh, Priest Lake area of Davidson County. And one of the things that um, I would like to express on behalf of many people, I think a lot of the pushback that you receive as developers is because of the lack of communication between THDA and the local elected members. And I think that creates a lot of that pushback. And one of the things that I think that would help in your quest to inform people about what affordable housing is versus low income housing, tax credit properties, uh, I think working with the council person, you can move the needle uh, to where people can start being more receptive to developments that say affordable housing. Um, one of the things I would like for you to look at at THDA is the clustering aspect. Mm -hmm. um, the affordable for affirmative furthering fair housing rule that uh, has just passed on the federal level. We want to make sure that uh, Nashville does not follow Texas and other states where when gentrification occurs, you start to see um, those folks being pocketed in the certain areas of the city. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see our city go in that direction. And so we need your help to ensure we don't do that. And I know, I know what you're talking about. We've, we've seen some interesting issues with that. One of the challenges, you're talking about not piling all of the projects in one area. Uh, one of the challenges though, is you're looking at areas where maybe it's a historically black community and you want to maintain it, that character, um, but then being not able to put a project there because of that concern is a, is a challenge sometimes for the developers. And, and I wish we could say where they want to build, but that's usually not up to us. Um, they, they do compete for the tax credit projects, so. Yeah, and I think you're, you're exactly right that a lot of times the tax credit developers are looking for affordable land. Mm -hmm. And so it ends up being in areas that um, are either outside of the core because of we know for sure that there's been an increase in value um, in the core. And so um, I would I see Angie Hubbard um, in the audience who uh, is working on the assessment of fair housing, and that's one of the components of, of what she's looking at. So you're exactly right. The good thing is we're, we're going through all of this around the same time. Of, um, hopefully that fair housing component will be completed soon and, and ready for public consum consumption. But um, MDHA has been going out and having community meetings just to talk about that concentration of poverty um, and the concentration of low-income development. Hi, uh, my name is Omid, and um, I live over in Cleveland Park, and I was kind of curious, um, I'll, I'll kind of preface my, my question with, with a quick statement. Um, is there any sort of policy that we can put in place, uh, I heard you mention preserving affordable housing, and you know, the reality from my perspective is we had it, we had plenty of affordable housing, and we sold it all. So what can we do to get ahead of this and go into communities where we can help preserve it? Because in our neighborhood, you know, we kept preaching and, and asking for pro-responsible development. We're not anti-development, but when the developers were coming in, we said, can you build stuff that's compatible with what's here instead of coming in and building, you know, $400,000, $500,000 houses that have now become the new norm, and I couldn't afford to live there if I was trying to move there now. So what, what kind of policies could you have from, like, when, you know, again, I go to planning, I go to council, and I see this stuff going on, 
where we can kind of rein it in a little bit. I know we can't control the market, but we can control policy. What can we do there? Yeah, I think that's why you've seen us do the housing incentives pilot program where we're saying to developers, please provide workforce housing. We will pay you to provide workforce housing. Um, additionally, I mean, I think as with anything, it takes a little bit of time. Um, and we know that we can't always compete with the market. I mean, that, that's just what it is. And so the more that neighbors, and you're talking to all the folks in your communities about how critical affordable housing is, and you're talking to um, elected officials about the importance of affordable housing in your neighborhood, those folks also need to come to the meetings. Um, and that, that's usually the hard part. Um, but that's what we need more of, more people. Um, we're, we're trying to create the policies, and we definitely have a lot of initiatives going on right now that increases the supply of affordable housing. Um, but we need neighbors and, and um, neighborhoods to basically also say to everybody else, we need affordable housing, or we need housing for our, our fellow uh, neighbors. So it, it's really going to be that whole YIMBYism concept, as, as um, the mayor mentioned today. Yeah. It's, it goes back to the cost of land. I mean, that, that is it. Um, there's a couple things. We don't, we don't do policy recommendations necessarily, but we do uh, provide issue briefs. And I know we've done one for Nashville and Sevier County because they're facing some of the same issues. Um, shared equity programs where you've got a nonprofit that pays or co-owns a percentage of the house and keeps that property in an affordable area or affordable price range. Um, land banks, um, which I think there's four in Tennessee, uh, is another one where you're holding land in trust um, and the developer is able to build on it with the proviso that it's going to be at a certain price point. Um, those are solutions that you can pursue, but it, it really depends on local interest. Just because of time, I'm going to have to cut off the questions at this point, but this also is good for future conversations as well. Uh, and we promised you that we'd, we'd give you an hour long program. Um, so thank you, panelists. Um, and if you'd like, if you want to return to your seats, we just have a, a few more videos to show and then we will be uh, concluding. Uh, at a recent presentation of LEED Academy, the freshmen presented their civic design showcase on gentrification. And I want to thank Ms. Lizette Garza for being here in the audience with us. Thank you so much. She's over there with some students. And Haley Flores, 14, told me, I don't want things to be gentrified. I want things to stay the same. And if you haven't been to LEED Academy, it's in Chestnut Hill. It's an area that's rapidly changing. And Frederick Hovey said, for me, I don't have a stance on whether it's good or bad. I think it's in the middle. Gentrification can improve a city a lot. It can help it grow, but there's a lot of negative impact on it. People getting evicted, housing going for too much. And one of the things we want to conclude with are uh, two videos and then telling you a little bit about the next part of the series. Uh, we have uh, videos of uh, Autumn Ontiveros and of Bianca King. It affects me by having me worry about my own family having to move again because we got new landlords at the, these new apartments that I moved to. And I'm worried that me and my father are going to have to move into place and we're not going to be able to afford to stay there long and we're going to have to keep moving and keep moving and keep moving. And then see them tear down old homes that I've lived in since, for, for long and tear, take all those memories away and build more expensive homes that could be triple the rent. Um, it just really, it really makes me like feel hurt inside because, um, because I don't really want to see my memories go away by people who don't care about other people. And then we have the video of Bianca King. And again, I should have mentioned that the students, uh, Haley and Frederick and Ms. Garza, are here in the room over here. So thank you so much for being here. If you want to just wave your arms over there. Uh, it's hard. I, I would say it means progression, but I also mean, I feel like it could be a bit of oppression as well. Um, because when you look at growth, you look at no matter how minute it is, everybody has the opportunity to grow. Um, but when I think of elderly people such as my grandma or some of the elders that 